This week's lecture, lecture three, will be covering the theories of color relationships. We'll be looking at the various color theorists throughout history and taking a look at their discoveries and how they affected how we treat color and how we learn about color. Artists have long sought a framework for understanding the great variations among colors, how colors can be mixed from materials at hand, and how these mixtures relate to each other visually. The ancient Hindu Upanishads, the early Greek philosophers and physicians, and the Arab physicist Al-Hazen all developed theories about color vision, what colors are and how we see them, to help explain the world around them. The Greek philosopher Aristotle explained similarities among colors by the common origin of nearly all colors in blends of different strengths of sunlight and firelight and of air and water, and recognized that darkness is due to the privation of light. To Aristotle, all variations were the result of mixtures of darkness and light. Crimson, for example, was a combination of a certain amount of blackness with firelight or sunlight. For centuries, colors were explained according to his theories. The reds seen at sunrise and sunset were thought to result from a mixture of white sunlight with the darkness of night that was just departing or approaching. The red and fire was a mixture of the white light of the fire and the darkness of the smoke it produced. In contrast, green and blue were considered shadows, one darker than the other. Combining his passion for science and art, Leonardo da Vinci included colors in his explorations. Though previous philosophers had not treated white and black as colors, da Vinci included them in what he called simple colors that were the artist's basic tools white, yellow, green, blue, red, and black. He observed the phenomenon later known as simultaneous contrast, which demonstrated that complementary hues intensify each other if juxtaposed. <clears throat> In his book, Treatise on Painting, published after his death, he devoted considerable attention to his observations of blueness in the atmosphere. He concluded that we only see this blue when contrasted with black. In addition to noting optical effects of color, he also described atmospheric perspectives and shadow effects in great detail. In his painting, The Virgin and Saint Anne, we see the Virgin Mary reaching for the Christ child while seated on her mother's lap, her mother being Saint Anne. A typical treatment of paintings by da Vinci was to set his figures, whether they are portraits or religious imagery, in landscapes that are somewhat relative to the area of Italy, but then also somewhat alien. The group, the trio in the foreground sits in a relatively Italian landscape. But behind them, the blue landscape looks almost alien. It looks like it's from another planet. Now, the type of rocky, craggy landscape was da Vinci's signature for many of his paintings. But the blueness is an expression of atmospheric perspective. The landscape is being colored by the atmosphere, by the particulates in the air, be it moisture or smoke or pollutants. He discovered that the atmosphere will change the color of a landscape. The further away you get from the object you're looking at, the more the color will change. We can see this around us today as we drive down the freeways or if we're on a hike looking out towards the city, you can see that the colors appear muted. They might appear gray or blue, and it's because of the atmosphere clouding it and changing the colors that we see. Jumping ahead to Isaac Newton, physicist Newton turned observed color phenomena into a complete laboratory study of the properties of light 
in an attempt to derive a logical framework to understand color. As we previously discussed, Newton demonstrated that all spectral hues are present in white light and made from them the first color wheel representing color relationships. He also demonstrated that the color spectrum could be reassembled into white light. The segments of his wheel represented the seven hues he distinguished in the spectrum. Interestingly, the seven hues he discovered are mystically influenced by the seven musical tones and the seven heavenly spheres or planets. These were his seven primary colors. He envisioned that hues would be the most intense at the perimeter of his wheel, gradually diluted with whiteness as they approached the center, which was white, representative of all colors blending to form white light. Newton also noticed that if two opposing hues were mixed, the result would not be white, but some faint anonymous color. So there's his explanation of neutrals. Remember that two complements mixed together will create a neutral. So here's Newton's wheel. In his theory, all colors come together to create white. So at the center of his wheel is white. So on the perimeter, the colors are more intense. And as they get closer to the center, they become lighter. So they create almost a pastel effect the closer they get to the center. Here we have an image of Newton's oscillating prism. This is one of his tests to discover the spectral hues of white light. In this experimental machine, the prism is rocked by turning the crank, alternately splitting the light into spectral hues and then reversing the process, creating white light without altering the assembly. So we have a hand crank and then here, we can't really see it because it's clear crystal, but here is our prism, which would oscillate. Newton also developed the seven mirrored apparatus to prove his theory of white light containing all spectral hues. As there are seven colors in the spectrum, each mirror targets a single color and all are reflected back to a single point being turned into white light. So within laboratory settings, we always need to prove our theories forward and backward. So here he has the prism splitting the light each color of light is aimed at a certain mirror. The mirrors will then reflect the light up to the ceiling and they will show white light. And another experiment he conducted was with his color wheel. So wedges of colored paper <clears throat> are glued to a rotating wheel, which spins before the viewer. The colors blur together and the eye, unable to process all of the colors as they move, will read the blurred color wheel as white. The next theorist we look at is Moses Harris, who was an English entomologist, that is someone who studies insects, and engraver. And he was the first to develop a model of pigment primaries working with pigments rather than light. Following the discovery by French printer J.C. Leblanc in 1731 that all hues could be reduced to a mixture of red, yellow, and blue, Moses created a hand-tinted colored wheel with three pigment primaries, which he called primitives at its center. And here is that wheel. Off to the right is an example of his work. Uh, you can see his botanical observations, his moths and butterflies, and his beautiful use of color to illustrate both. From his primitives, he derived the secondary or compound hues of orange, purple, and green. Mixtures of primaries and compounds yielded two intermediate stages in which the hue less represented in the mixture was named first. So orange red, for instance, which is a orangey red that is more red than orange. So the hue represented less always goes first in those arrangements, such as blue green, um, blue violet, red violet, and so on. 
So Harris defines our primaries and also defines the secondary or compound colors. The 18 colors he creates were then graded into shades, which are darker values, and tints, which are lighter values, commonly created by adding white to a color. So we have discussed tints, tones, and shades already, but tints add white, tones add gray, and shades add black. So you explored this not only in your value brilliance scale, but also in your 12 color color wheel that you worked on. Next up is Johann Goethe, who was a poet. He published a book, Theories of Colors, and attacked Newton and his work on the theories of light. Goethe emphasized a return to the observational traditions of Aristotle and da Vinci. He concentrated on color as a visual phenomenon happening in the eye, rather than as an aspect of light. He gave us extremely detailed observations of visual phenomena still of interest today, such as colored shadows, simultaneous contrast, and successive contrast. With reference to colored shadows, Goethe noted that strong midday sunlight produced a black or gray shadow on white, but in other conditions, shadows will be the hue complementary to the hue of the light. These other conditions included that the light be of some other hue than white, and that the shadow be illuminated by a secondary light source. So in this editorial cosmetics image, we see colored shadows. Light is not being projected into these darker areas. It's actually a result of the colored light being projected on the model. Remember that the shadow will be the complementary hue. So we have a lot of complementary colors going on here. And it's not cosmetics. It's not any special lighting other than tinted gels over the light themselves. But you can see that by shining red, we create a green shadow. By shining orange, we create a purple shadow. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. And granted, this is exaggerated. We are focusing on that, trying to create this phenomenon. In a more organic, everyday setting, it would not be as noticeable. But with Goethe's observation, he made this discovery. He discovered that the stronger the colored light, the paler the shadow. Thus, the most brilliant colored shadows would come from the palest light. The Impressionists and Post-Impressionists acknowledged these observations, adding colored shadows to the bright hues of some of their works. Goethe also described complex color sensations, such as the catotorpoical color seen when colorless light strikes a colorless surface, such as a spider's web or mother of pearl, as well as the rings around the moon. So here we have that phenomenon in this abalone shell. The shell technically is colorless, but it also has a reflective prismatic surface. So as the light travels across the shell, color is created. But if we took the shell apart and looked at the individual layers, we would not see the color at all. And of course, our old friend, the cobweb, which is completely transparent, um, we know that because how many of them have we walked through in our lifetime and then freaked out when we were covered in spider webs? But the cobweb is transparent unless light hits it. And in this instance, we have morning dew on the spider web as well, giving us another prismatic effect as each little dewdrop acts as a little prism, emphasizing the architecture of the web. Goethe suggested two models for relationships between colors. One was a circle with lines linking complementary hues superimposed on two triangles, delineating primary and secondary triads. And here's an example of that. So complements are linked together. We have two imposed triangles creating triads.
The other was a triangle with red, blue, and yellow at its outermost points, and the secondaries of green, orange, and purple at the center. Dividing primaries and secondaries were further triangles denoting the less saturated lower value tertiaries that will result from mixing two secondaries with the adjacent primary. Now that is a mouthful. And this is a color relationship pyramid that we really don't refer to that often. In Goethe's writing and in his art, this is something that he understood and that he felt was the most rational, but really the color wheel is what we use the most. But in his color pyramid, we have our primaries at the outermost corners. We have our secondaries filling in the gaps. So yellow and red make orange, red and blue make purple, yellow and blue make green. But then the color that bridges the gap between these three is a mixture of those three colors. So these are not our true tertiaries. Um, they're not our red violet, they're not our blue green. So this is not really recognized today, but it is Goethe's theory. It does make sense, but it's not the most clear cut way to understand color harmonies and relationships. Next up is Michel Eugène Chevreul, who was an early 19th century chemist and doesn't he look like it? Author of The Principles of Harmony and Contrast of Colors, and the director of the Dye House for Gobelin Tapestries in Paris. So, Gobelin was a tapestry maker. They wove wool wall hangings for the wealthy. Not only would the tapestry house have designers creating the images that would be woven into pictures or patterns but they also dyed their own yarns. So Chevreul was a chemist in charge of creating the dyes for the wool. By the 19th century, we begin to use chemical compounds to create color. Prior to that, color was rendered from natural sources, plant, animal, or mineral. With the advent of new technology and sciences, we are able to create any color that we want. Not only can we have any color we want, but it will also last almost indefinitely because chemical dyes don't fade. They are more color fast. The organic natural pigments that were used were susceptible to light, to moisture, to changes in the environment. They could fade and they were unstable. Color will still fade today because of UV rays, but it is much more stable than a natural pigment was. And natural pigments are still used. There is a warmth to them. There is a glow to them, but they are volatile. So with Chevreul and other chemists like him, we were able to perpetuate chemical dyes that would give us vibrant, almost lurid colors that would last and last. Chevreul's greatest contribution to the art of color was his explanation of the laws governing the visual effects of color, simultaneous contrast, successive contrast, and optical color mixing. From these, he derived certain suggestions about how color should best be used. He gives us the principles of color harmonies. He noted that colors with little contrast, such as hues adjacent to each other on a color wheel, what we call analogous hues, will tend to blend optically. He felt they worked best when the key hue was a primary. Highly contrasting colors presented in large areas will make each other appear more brilliant without changing in their hue. Conversely, small areas of contrasting colors will blend to create a duller sensation. So here in a small area, by blending two contrasts together, you're essentially neutralizing them. In large areas, they will appear more brilliant. So we discussed this when we were talking about complementary hues. Going through time, next up, we consider the work of Albert Munsell who developed the standards for color notation still used as the basis for pigment specifications in the US, Britain, Germany, and Japan. 
These were first published in 1905 in his book, Color Notation. Munsell used three dimensions for describing color variation, hue, value, and chroma. So hue is the color, value is the lightness or darkness, and chroma is the saturation of the color. And each of these he graded in equal steps. These dimensions form an irregular three-dimensional tree because the hues reach maximum saturation at different steps of value and also vary in the number of steps from a neutral gray to maximum saturation. Munsell gave each step in each direction a distinctive number reflecting the three dimensions. Vertical represents the value or lightness or darkness. Horizontal represents the saturation of the color and around the circumference represents the hue. So here's his color tree. So around the circumference, we have the colors, and then we have lightness or darkness, and then we have saturation. So quite a distinct way of thinking about color, but it does make a lot of sense because we want to consider all three of those elements, hue, value, and chroma, when we are looking at color. Munsell also used five primary colors instead of the traditional three, making some, for some very odd complementary pairings. Here's his wheel, showing the five primaries being red, yellow, green, a deep sort of inky blue, and almost a fuchsia color. So interesting complements, but actually still really beautiful together. You know, red and turquoise blue is a gorgeous combination. Royal purple and orange is a beautiful combination. So not a bad thing, but not what we conventionally use today. Lastly, we look at the work of uh, Johannes Eiten, who was a Swiss expressionist painter, designer, teacher, writer, and theorist. From 1919 to 1922, Eiten taught at the Bauhaus, developing the innovative preliminary course, which was to teach students the basics of material characteristics, composition, and color. If you're not familiar with the Bauhaus, you will learn a lot about it when you take your history of interiors and architecture. The Bauhaus was a German art and architecture school. It was headed by some of the greatest architects and artists of the early 20th century. Mies van der Rohe was a headmaster. Eiten was a headmaster. Um, numerous other artists came out of there, such as Kandinsky. It was a hotbed of creativity that unfortunately was cut short by the rise of the Nazi regime. The Bauhaus was populated almost entirely by Jewish students and faculty. And on top of that, most of them were also communists or socialists, and the Nazis didn't like any of those things. So the school was closed down, and those that could escape did escape. Van der Rohe would immigrate to the United States and find much success as an architect here. Eiten theorized seven types of color contrasts. His contrasts included contrast by hue, by value, by color temperature, by complement or neutralization, simultaneous contrast, which was pioneered by Chevreul, contrast by saturation, which is the mixture with gray, and contrast by extension. In 1920, he published The Art of Color and in 1921 developed a color sphere modeled on the ideas of Philippe Otto Rung, an 18th century theorist. It included 12 colors with pure hues displayed around the equator. Through the central axis was the gray value scale with black at the bottom and white on top. Colors were graded from black to white in seven steps across the surface. Intermediate mixtures theoretically lay inside the sphere. Eiten also displayed the sphere by opening it up into a 12-pointed star. So if we look at Eiten's sphere, it's essentially Albers tree, but turned into a sphere form because we have our true colors around the equator 
lightness and darkness at the center, and then in theory, saturation running towards the center. Here, is it, here it is displayed as a 12 pointed star, which also goes back to our 12 color wheel. Although it is inverted a little bit because our pure colors are right here in the middle ring and we go lighter towards the center and darker towards the outside. So all of these theorists helped us understand color. And today, the color theory courses that we teach and that you learn from are based on these ideas that were established hundreds of years ago. So everything that we learn is not a new discovery, but our individual discovery of the subject is.